make sure to be quick in increasing prices. Ideally, combine this with additional value to meet your profitability targets. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the revolutionary relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and our guest today is Danilo Zata. I'm going to say Dan from here on out. Here are three things you want to know about Dan before we start. He is a consultant's consultant. If you've ever been in pricing consulting, he's probably worked at your firm. Uh, so he's been with Accenture, SKP, BCG, you name it, he's been there. Uh, he wrote The Pricing Model Revolution, which we're going to talk about today. And believe it or not, he started his career as a windsurfing instructor. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. Great to be here with you. It's going to be fun. So how did you get into pricing? Yeah, it uh, started um, as a generalist. So I was working on all types of uh, projects when I started my career as a young consultant. I was cost-cutting. I was doing process optimization. I was uh, <clears throat> optimizing um post-merger integrations. And then I realized that of all these things, pricing is the most fun activity. Because when you do a cost-cutting activity, you have to discuss with unions. People are in a bad mood. <clears throat> you leave uh, not only friends behind. On pricing, it's different. On pricing, you increase profitability. We are speaking about growth. We are speaking about uh, increased profits. And uh, people are happy to work with you because you are supporting them to grow and to become better. So. Um, Pricing is simply more fun. Well, so first off, I agree 100%. But don't you find that salespeople hate you when you raise prices? That's uh, that's very true. The trick is to understand how to make sure that they are part of the game, that they see that this is also their baby. And if they do things right, there is an upside for them as well. So if you manage to find this way to make sure that they are on your side, then uh, they will also have fun. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so let's talk about your book, The Pricing Revolution. And first off, why'd you write it? Well, um, I'm uh, traveling quite a bit during the week, staying away from home. And so one of the things that relaxes me is writing and collecting ideas. So I started collecting a number of ideas and cases around how companies are changing the way they monetize. I find this fascinating because there are so many cool ideas on how to create a new source of competitive advantage through innovative price models. So I started collecting them. And then I had so many, and then uh, I thought, why not putting them all together in a book? There might be some uh, some value to, to have uh, a deep dive on them. So things uh, developed in this way. Okay, um, so I'm a little disappointed you only had 10. <laughs> 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 That's a good point, Mark. Indeed, you can also create more hybrid ones. But I was also afraid to create a, a book that is uh, too scary and big then, and people would not want to have it. So I said, let's limit it. Uh, but you're fully right. There are so many and uh, many more coming out of a hybrid combination of them. And uh, you could uh, write for sure a second book, and I would buy it because I bought your other books and I find them all great. Thank you so much, by the way. Um, so as I as I uh, read through some of the chapters, in fact, I'll tell you the ones I the chapters I actually read were the ones where I didn't know what you were talking about before <laughs> yeah, before the I couldn't tell what it was from the title of the chapter. Um, but as I read through them, it's like, oh well, this is this and this and this, and so there's a bunch of different models inside mm -hmm. a chapter, which is pretty funny. And and probably the easiest one to think about is your first model which is usage-based pricing. Yeah. Yeah, correct. And, and, and again, here you're right. I think pricing is not a precise science. There are different namings for things that uh, people consider to be similar. So um, I took the names that I found the most meaningful, but I can understand your thoughts that maybe uh, you were thinking to find something different simply because uh, there are no rules set in stone. Yeah, nobody, there, there is no governing body to say, here's what we call things. So we exactly. have to call them whatever we want. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. We can still shape a bit uh, uh, what we are talking about. Yeah, and, and so uh, I'll give you my favorite example of that. That that is a challenge in our industry, I think, and it fits along with your first chapter, uh, which is the pay per use or per wash or usage based pricing. That whole model. Um, there are people like me who call that a pricing metric, right? So what is it that you're going to charge for? And then there are other people in the industry who call that a value metric. Um, and so yeah. I, I find that really challenging because I use value metric to mean how is it that your customers measure the value? Right? Yeah. What is it that they get value from? Yeah. So I, I find that an interesting one. No, that, that, I think it's, it's a very good thought. And it shows also uh, that in pricing, we can get very technical. But let me then reveal a secret to you. Namely, one another reason why I wrote this book. <clears throat> the reason was that before writing this book, I wrote a very technical book called Revenue Management in Manufacturing. And indeed, this was also part of my PhD uh, thesis. So really uh, academic. And as my wife is a English teacher, I gave the previous book to her to ask her to review it. And then she told me, as she's not a pricing expert, this book is really boring. Don't give it to any friends because you will lose friends. And then I said, well, if my wife tells me this, probably others will think about uh, this book the same. So I was uh, really wanting with the Pricing Model Revolution to write a book that is not necessary for experts like you, Mark, but for managers who are not experts in pricing. I wanted to make it more appealing. So you will find in the book a lot of stories that have nothing to do with pricing, some introductions and taking something about poetry, history, and many other elements and link them back to pricing. And I was so happy that when my wife read some of the parts of the new book, she enjoyed it. And this was also my, my, uh, my goal to have something that uh, people enjoy who are not experts. That's why you will not find uh, a lot of formulas or technicalities. Also, what you just mentioned before, it's not deep dived, but there are more stories. It's about uh, showing the power of pricing, showing the power of innovative price models and how this can change. And I think that uh, the lots, uh, a lot of feedbacks that came were, were exactly going to this direction. They enjoyed the fact that there were a lot of examples. It was not too technical, but still uh, helping to understand what pricing is all about and what, especially when you calibrate price strategies, you can create. Yeah, I, I personally love writing for managers, not for pricing people or not for academics. In, in fact, did you find it hard to stop writing for academics? Well, uh, be, being a, a, an academic myself, because I, I studied <clears throat> economics, I did my PhD, uh, I did a, an MBA. So I was always trained to think and write in, in a certain way. But then when I got this shocking feedback from my wife, I thought this is probably what a lot of managers are thinking who are not uh, uh, trained or are not thinking in the way I think. So why not changing our language to communicate and be more appealing also for these people who maybe are leading corporations, but need a different language to understand what we mean? Yes, perfect. Uh, I remember I, I learned to write as an academic as well. And then probably five years later, I stopped writing that way. And nowadays I hate reading academic papers. I just can't do it. I said, why, why don't you write in English? <laughs> <laughs> good point. Good point. Th that's why I also try to kill all notes or references, everything which uh, sounds academic, because at the end, <clears throat> it's the content, the cases, the story that um, uh, inspires people rather than uh, proving that this was quoted somebody else, some, somebody else where. Okay. So let's talk about some of these models. I'm going to toss you a softball question. What's your favorite model? Well, um, what I like a lot uh, is, for example, the one based on artificial intelligence. Uh, on one hand, there is a buzz because everybody speaks about artificial intelligence. But then I started myself using this and I was uh, myself amazed by the power that this can have. To be honest, uh, here I'm always, always very open with you. I'm not um, capable of programming a very complex algorithm, but I'm sitting with a lot of brains, uh, PhDs in uh, statistics, mathematics, physics, and I explain to them what the algorithm sh shall be able to do. And then together we create some uh, powerful things. Let me give you one example. 
a large automotive corporation uh, came, uh, reached out to me and was asking me if I could support them improving the spare parts pricing activities. And then uh, the, the, the CEO um, brought me to the spare parts pricing team. And I, when I was sitting with them, they told me, we are sitting here together with you only because the CEO wanted. Because if it was for us, <clears throat> we would never work with you because we are already super expensive and we are <clears throat> part of a <clears throat> an exchange with other brands. So we have everything under control. So what do you think you can bring as a added value here? And then I did my best to create a specific algorithm for this company that was taking into account, for example, competitive prices, was looking into technical features, how large, how heavy, how big are different prices, uh, spare parts, was looking into historical data. <clears throat> and as they had hundreds of thousands of spare parts, it was impossible to do this manually or driven by a, a simple uh, Excel table. So the algorithm was able to spot a lot of opportunities all the cases where spare parts were too cheap or not rounded in the perfect way and so on. And then when I showed this back to the team, they were quite puzzled. We started implementing right away in the project. And so after very, very few weeks, they already had half a million additional profit impact through all these small changes that were hundreds of spare parts we optimized. And then we became friends and they said, wow, we didn't think that uh, AI-based pricing can do such things. And this is just an example. There are many more. So this is something that I find very sexy and cool, namely helping already very advanced organizations with something like AI-based pricing. Yeah, I wonder if that opportunity is going to be minimized in the future because now everybody's thinking about AI and how can we use it? And so maybe they're using it on their own before you walk in the door. That, that's a, a very good thought. Probably there will be some developments to, towards this direction. But to be honest, <clears throat> I also see that a lot of corporations are still uh, using cost plus and uh, are lacking a pricing manager and uh, use some sort of Excel tool and uh, the numbers they have are not uh, clean and cleansed and the data is missing. So I think even if you're fully right, there will be more uh, more mature companies on this side. Still, there is a, a big amount of companies who need to fix the basics. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. <laughs> okay, so I tossed you a softball. Now let me give you uh, one that I that I didn't like the title, but I want to talk to you about it if that's okay. <laughs> so I, the very last one you have on here is called neuropricing. Yeah. I'm like, what the heck is neuropricing? <laughs> so I moved to the chapter. I'm, I'm whipping through the chapter. And it turns out that, that I would have called that behavioral economics, right? Because everything in there is the instantaneous, or if you think of Danny Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, it's system one thinking, hey, I just responded or I just replied. I didn't really, I didn't really logically debate what the decision should be. Yeah, yeah. And, and so would you is it the same thing as behavioral economics or am I yeah. missing something? No, I think uh, it, it's uh, very well captured and uh, I can see that you are a true expert. You, I cannot hide or change names for you. You will immediately discover this. <laughs> no, the, the, the fun thing is that I have a couple of friends that uh, are applying this <clears throat> and they use, for example, uh, all sorts of sophisticated machines that could uh, uh, measure brain pulses to understand in which direction things are moving. So I find this fascinating. I like the name neuropricing because you, you connect it to your brain, to neurons, to, to discovering what, what is going on in your brain. So th this is the reason why I chose this name. But um, uh, the essence is, uh, as you said, to understand how behaviors are also steered and how people are thinking, how customers are acting, and how you can steer preferences uh, by uh, creating the, the, the right framing. So uh, I could agree with you. Uh, we, we can change the name. Uh, I like both. That's okay. You, you have to call <laughs> it whatever you want. Um, and so the machines that these people are using, are these the uh, the field MRI machines? Exactly. They're exactly. watching inside the brain? Yeah, yeah. And, and there are different uh, uh, experiments conducted in the US and in Europe. So there are a number of scientists doing this. And I, I think it's it's very interesting. <clears throat> probably it's not so widespread yet. Uh, probably it will take some time. Probably it's also linked to a higher cost than the, the classical market research that, that also represents a barrier. But I think it's fascinating to see all the direction that pricing is taking. 
to really explore uh, what the preference and thinking of, of uh, customers are. Yeah, I think it's the large um, CPG firms that are mostly doing this fMRI stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Th 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 this is uh, very appealing to them. You would find it uh, rarely in uh, in B two B, even if there are some cases. But uh, you're fully right. Yeah. Okay. So that was my first one. What's your second one? Uh, by the way, by the way, I've got one more. I'm going to actually disagree with you on. So, <laughs> so get ready. Um, okay. What's your second favorite? Well, what I also like a lot uh, is the outcome-based pricing or, or the ones that measure uh, based on what you are producing. <clears throat> and here you can uh, uh, create new um, new value for customers because what they want is maybe not the product, but uh, what you can do with the products. The classical example is the drilling machine. You don't want the drilling machine, you want the hole. So why not changing the way you are uh, selling and producing and uh, marketing and and, uh, and and pricing also these these products, and of course Peter Drucker, as one of the most prominent management thinkers of our times, exactly uh, pointed out to this point that people are not wanting the the products themselves but the value they get out of them. So let's think about the value also when we price, and uh, looking into outcomes could be one of those. And uh, there are a couple of nice examples. <clears throat> I love, for example, what you find on YouTube, where you can find uh, this pay per laugh uh, video that is really hilarious, <clears throat> where you see that a small theater in Spain uh, that was facing bankruptcy because prices went up due to in increased um, uh, taxes and uh, spectators were staying away, <clears throat> but the quality of the shows was still great. And what they did was to say, well, people are coming here to laugh. And as we are sure that they will laugh, uh, they fitted all their seats with some facial recognition devices. And you would pay each time you laugh for a maximum of something like 24 euros uh, so that you would not pay <laughs> for laughing too much. And uh, and this was a major success. And uh, really, uh, it's worthwhile looking at this uh, YouTube video because it's so great and so cool. And uh, and shows that also small companies with a bit of fantasy, with a bit of digital technology that is now much more affordable for everyone, can really change the way they are competing and create like this also a new source of competitive advantage. Okay, so let me push back just a little bit. By, by the way, I love the theater example, I really do. <laughs> um, so part of the problem I have with outcome-based pricing is when we sell B2B, the outcome or the value that we're always selling is increased profitability. And companies don't want to give you a share of their increased <laughs> profitability. Um, and, and so I, there are some examples where you see that. So a, um, a lawyer who does a contingency fee is taking 30% of the, the, the um, lawsuit settlement. Yeah. Okay, so that's outcome-based pricing. Or you could think of a credit card or PayPal as taking 1% or 2% of the revenue. That's outcome-based pricing. But those are pretty rare examples. Uh, most of the time in B2B, we're not, companies aren't willing to give up a percentage of their additional profit in order to achieve this outcome. Yeah, I think that this is a very good point because it's also about transparency and sharing information that is linked to profitability. And many do not want to share this. So in some cases, you also see failures of these models. <clears throat> and one of uh, the, the, the things I learned to overcome these failures is the incentive model, both with clients, but also with your own sales team to make sure that they have the right incentives to sell something. I'm working with a corporation. They do amazing machines. These are high-tech machines, premium machines, very expensive ones. <clears throat> and they started selling this uh, in a different way. For example, they started selling an equipment as a service <clears throat> where the outcome is, uh, for example, how much are you printing or how much are you producing? So these types of outcomes. But then <clears throat> even if this um, model was super profitable for the corporation, they realized that it was not selling as they were hoping for. And then uh, doing some studies, we realized that salespeople are very simple. They said, why the heck shall I sell this machine <clears throat> based on outcomes, which means that my uh, commission will be diluted over many years for all the outcomes when I can sell it in the old school transactional manner where you give me so much money today when you buy it and own it, and I have a big commission and I can buy a new car or I have a luxurious vacation already this year. 
So if you are not changing your processes, the way you're approaching how salespeople are compensated, then you you risk to have an issue with the uh, model that maybe is great, but it's not pushed internally. And the same can be the case with incentives for, for clients. So the point you made is, is very valid and you need really this holistic view before you're introducing new innovative revenue models. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I, I love the idea of outcome-based pricing. I, I think it's, it isn't practical or accepted often enough. Um, but, but if it's accepted, if it's feasible, boy, I like that one a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's very true. Okay, I'm going to give you the one that I don't like or I disagree with. <laughs> yeah. And so convince me why I'm wrong. <laughs> but first off, define sympathetic pricing. Yeah, sympathetic pricing, <laughs> and I like to pick this one, is uh, using pricing to gain uh, goodwill with customers. Because also with pricing, you can go do good things. But you also can uh, mess it up. <clears throat> and this is the case of what happens with, for example, search pricing with uh, companies like Uber or Lyft. <clears throat> when there were some terrorist attacks, be it in London or in the, in the US, uh, simply not monitoring the algorithm made it super expensive uh, because demand peaked. Everybody wanted to escape the location where there was a big danger. But uh, this, of course, is not something that uh, was monitored. So prices were going up because demanding demand was exploding. However, if you would uh, uh, do this in a different way and see there is a big strike, like at the moment here in Germany, where I'm based, where trains <coughs> are not moving around and everything is paralyzed, and you would say, look, I want to support you because it's raining, there is strike, I will reduce prices. Uh, I will communicate this. I will um, help you in this bad situation because the weather is uh, is crap. <clears throat> the, the strike is kicking in. You cannot c come home. It's Friday afternoon. And uh, by uh, doing a sympathetic pricing and giving you a, a massive discount, you'll be very happy to share this great experience on social networks and with your, with your friends. And maybe in the future, you will also be willing to accept higher prices with a good memory of uh, me as a company having helped you out in the moment of need. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would agree that occasional sympathetic pricing builds brand value, brand loyalty, brand trust, but I don't see that as a pricing model in the sense that I'm doing a, a single act so that I can raise prices on you later. Now, I got to say in Germany, if the train strike goes on for a long period of time, Uber should be raising prices. <laughs> Uber should be charging a lot more money and making a lot of money and not saying, oh, sorry, you guys are in pain. Because what we typically think of in the world of pricing is I want to charge based on what my customers are willing to pay. Yeah, yeah. And if when the trains aren't running, willingness to pay is much higher. Yeah, and and I'm here with you. I think it, it's a, a question of price fairness. I find the topic of price fairness always very interesting because you can read a number of studies. For example, why shall a blue razor be cheaper than a pink razor? This was a, a big discussion for identical products that just are targeting male or female customers and have uh, completely different prices. Or the topic that we just mentioned <clears throat> uh, about fairness in a dangerous situation, and uh, is it then okay to uh, have massive um, profits when there is a, 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 a difficult situation? Or what about these drugs that are uh, sold to patients who maybe cannot afford them? They have a rare disease, and you are asking for a very, very high price, maybe a million of US dollar to save the, the life of a child. So that there is a lot of debate going on here. <clears throat> so I think um, what you said is fully true, and I support it fully. If there is a strike, uh, then Uber is the winner, and everybody understands that there is higher demand and they shall pay more. But maybe uh, there is also the possibility to be consistently uh, sympathetic in order to make sure that you are the preferred brand, because this will pay back, this will bring profits, this will help you growing as a company if you are not uh, felt as being um, not sympathetic, not fair, 
and uh, taking a, a advantage of difficult situations. So I'm not saying that you should uh, uh, lose profitability and do it constantly, but if you do it regularly, <clears throat> then uh, you will uh, probably have a stronger brand and a stronger customer base than the companies who are not applying sympathetic pricing. Okay. Um, so, so you brought up the concept of fairness. And when I teach fairness, by the way, oh, cool. I always say, I always say that, uh, fairness is in the mind of your buyer, right? There, there's no way that we know what fair is or fair, fair means. That's a good, so, good way of expressing it. I like it. And so what we have to do is a understand the way our buyers are thinking or behaving and B make sure that we price in a way that looks fair to our buyers. Right. That makes all the sense in the world. So now let's talk about Uber at a terrorist activity, right? Everybody's trying to leave a terrorist event. Why would an Uber driver drive towards a terrorist event? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you want to save more people, you raise prices so that Uber drivers are willing to drive towards the event. Yeah. Yeah. This would be logic. But still, there are emotions and irrationality. And uh, if you read then uh, the press of what happened after these events with the prices that went up, there was uh, massive criticism because people would expect that uh, there is also help provided. But uh, I mean, uh, this is an incentive, so it works. Uh, I I'm with you. Uh, it it's, again, a, a matter of communication, of a price image, of fairness, a difficult topic because there are emotional and different views on this. I I agree completely. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. We're going to run out of time here, Dan, but I'm going to give you one more. If you have one more, you want to talk, by the way, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking my, my shots on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. I like to be challenged because only if you're challenged, then uh, you can uh, improve and learn. So uh, great to, to, to talk with you about this and uh, have also a different opinion. So do you have one more that you really like? Yeah, well, uh, it's the one that I call psychological pricing. And here uh, we all know uh, what, it's, what it's about, namely making sure that you can sell the product that you want to sell, sell it even more at, uh, uh, without discounting it, without doing any promotions. And the classical example is the one of the three bottles of wine or two that you find in the supermarket. So if you have only two bottles of wine and you are not having an expert that is a super wine connoisseur, uh, this person probably will uh, choose the one that is cheaper to avoid a regret decision and say, I chose the one that is more expensive, but I was not able to appreciate it. And the question is, how can we more than double the more expensive bottle without losing, uh, without giving any discount, without doing a promotion, without re uh, reducing prices. And the magical word is with psychological pricing, simply putting an anchor in front of it. So a third bottle, which is more expensive and suddenly the complete uh, setup of the choice will change because uh, suddenly uh, shoppers will say, I don't want the crappy wine. Who knows what's inside this? And maybe the one that is uh, too expensive is something that I will not appreciate. So let me take the gold, golden middle and I will take the one that before was maybe picked only by 20% of the consumers. And now shoppers are taking this by 50% of them are taking this. So th this is really uh, some kind of magic because you are steering uh, your customers to the preferences that you would like them to, to express. And you can do this in B2B and B2C. And uh, uh, by creating the right settings, you, you you simply steer preferences and minds. Yeah, I love that one. Um, I I tell all of my clients at least think about putting together a good, better, best portfolio. Maybe you can't, but at least try. And absolutely, a huge difference. A, a good recommendation, Mark. So. Excellent. Dan, this has just been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it, uh, but we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm going to ask you the final question though. What is one piece of pricing advice you'd give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Well, one advice that I would give is to really consider always increasing prices. <clears throat> we all saw the impact of uh, volatility of raw materials. There is still in a number of countries inflation so rather than waiting, make sure that you're not losing time because uh, the more time passes when uh, costs are increasing, 
the more time you will need to recover profitability. So make sure to be quick in increasing prices. Ideally, combine this with additional value to uh, meet your profitability targets. I think that's great advice. And and in fact, I think companies should be thinking about how do you raise prices every year, even if there's not inflation. Good point, Mark. And, and so you could do that based on how add more value to the product, add more value to your offer. Absolutely. Excellent. Dan, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? They can contact me via LinkedIn. So I'm on, on LinkedIn uh, and uh, I would be super happy to connect and uh, keep in touch. Okay, and we'll have your LinkedIn URL in the show notes, I'm sure. And to our listeners, thank you for your time today. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? And if you have any questions about this podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.